He's also now at MIT. He's still with me. And the occasion is that there are epileptic patients, and a subset of these epileptic patients are refractory to pharmacological treatment. The drugs don't work anymore, and these patients will have one seizure a day or 10 seizures a day. And then a very successful um, surgical treatment is to take out, to identify what the foci is for certain types of seizures. It only works for the focal type of seizure. To identify where the foci originates, where the epileptic seizure originates, and then take out that part of the brain using a surgeon's knife. Now, in a subset of patients, you can't do that. You can't look e.g. don't know, sometimes you don't even know whether the seizure originates in the left or on the right side of the brain. So when you, then what you do, you do invasive brain surgery. So you drill 12, 10, 8, 10, 12 little burr holes and you insert macroelectrodes. So you insert these macroelectrodes, these are polyurethane, flexible, they have seven leads, platinum leads, and you insert these into the brain here, into the hippocampus, and then you can essentially do intracranial EGs, like EG outside, except now they're inside the brain, and you can do, they're monitored 24-7, and you can do triangulation to pinpoint where the, where the seizure originates. The patient is now in a clinic for three, four, five, six days until he or she has a couple of seizures, and the, 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 radio, the neuroradiologist can pinpoint it, and then the, the electrodes are taken out, and the, the foci is taken out, and it's a quite successful operation. Now, what Itzhak Fried did, they hollowed out this inner lumen, and they inserted through this inner lumen, now through this inner space, they insert these nine electrodes, nine conventional microelectrodes. We measure everything relative to one, so we have eight pieces, eight microwires in there, and there are eight to ten microwires, and we now have a 128 channel system. So we can now essentially record from a patient for a couple of days from 100 wires roughly in, inside the patient's head. And the patient can tell us directly what he, see, what he says. We have to do a lot of fancy signal processing because it's a very noisy environment. It's a clinic. It's not like inside a Faraday cage, like, like in a lab. It's a very noisy environment. There's EKG machines and all sorts of other stuff. But we do all of that. And then I'll, I'll just talk to you about this one study. It came out a year ago. We found these neurons in the medial temporal lobe. So this is a part of the brain, particularly the hippocampus, most of the neurons. This is a part of the brain that... But see, if you're going to remember anything tomorrow about today, about my talk today, it's because your visual input and your auditory input go together into the hippocampus, are somehow bound together, and are consolidated there, and that information ultimately is then sent out again to be remembered over the long term, if you're going to remember anything about this talk over the long term, in, in, the, rest of the, in the rest of the cortex. So those are the neurons that we're tapping into here. And we'll show, the time scale is here. This is three seconds. The two, can you see the two vertical bars? That's one second. So the image is shown for one second between those two vertical bars. It's an image on a laptop computer sitting on the lap of the patient. So this is one second before the stimulus, one second during the stimulus, one second after the stimulus. There are six trials, all randomly intermixed. So here's a picture of a, star, a spider. The neuron doesn't or fire one spike. You know, picture of, um, uh, what's his name, Kobe Bryant. The neuron fires once, not at all. Picture of these uh, actresses. The neuron doesn't really fire. Here you see um, uh, um, Jennifer Aniston, seven different pictures of Jennifer Aniston, the neuron fires a lot. Very selectively, exactly around 290, 300, 310 milliseconds, the neuron starts firing, so, which is a very long delay by, by monkey standards. Here is she's married, or she used to be married, turned out she's now divorcing, or has divorced, I guess she's divorced, I think. Um, and here you see pictures of her with her then husband, and the neuron didn't fire, so the neuron here did not fire uh, to, to when, when Jennifer Anderson was present with her husband. The neuron only fired to her. This is a different neuron. It has a higher maintain rate. This is probably multi-unit. The, the neuron has a highly maintained rate. But then you can still see superimposed, roughly at 300 milliseconds, it fires, in this case, to the Sydney Opera House, and here even to the text, Sydney Opera. Now, in terms of visuals, some of you I know are visual scientists or, or machine vision people, it's quite remarkable how invariant these cells are. And, of course, that's how invariant our memory is. Because this cell will respond whether it's yellow on black, blue on white, white on gray, or when it's the right? There's almost no, vis or there's no visual similarity at the bit level between this image and this image. Yet for us, they both represent Sydney Opera House and the neon fires to them. This is another uh, actress called... Um, Oh, she played in a uh, Catwoman. Catwoman. So she played in this movie Catwoman. Yeah, Halle Berry. She, she, uh, so here it's, it's um, you can see her in, a, in her dress. It's a line drawing of her. He, here there's, uh, you see different pictures of her. Here's another woman dressed as a cat, but the patient knew that wasn't, wasn't Halle Berry, so didn't fire. Again, fires to the text. 
on the same neuron, so we have multiple, um, we have multiple, we can listen, uh, because we, we do this um, wavelet decomposition, we can, on one neuron, on one electrode, we can listen to multiple neurons. So, so from the same wire you saw the previous Halle Berry cell, there was also Mother Teresa cell. Don't know why. <laughs> Pamela Anderson cell. Responds to Pamela Anderson. Uh, this responds to two objects. This responds either to this or to these. Uh, here's, uh, here's one to uh, Pitt, Brad Pitt and Jennifer Aniston. 15% of our cells respond to specific images, and one third of those, i.e. 5%, respond this invariant way. Now, it may well be possible that 100% of the images have half an hour, an hour time, then the patient is bored or his mother comes or the doctor comes and I have to stop the experiment, right? So that's an inherent limitation. Uh, but some of these neurons or a third of these neurons are very, very invariant. And you can try to do, um, so a little bit, I guess, what Les Valian talked about, you can try to use probabilistic reasoning about the sparseness of a neuron if you make a specific model. So we have a very simple uh, binary model of a neuron because we like to know, given we show, let's say, 100 images and given we have 80 neurons that we record from on one trial, and the next day we have, you know, 80 images and we have 12 neurons we record from. What are the, what are the, we'd like to put bounds on the sparseness of the neurons, right? To see how many neurons, what's the sparseness of the neuron? In other words, what fraction of the input images will they respond to? And how we try to estimate how many um, neurons will there be that code for a particular uh, percept, like, like Jennifer Anderson? Because we do have to explain the seemingly paradox that, you know, out of all the possible uh, percepts, um, uh, concepts. Psychologists estimate uh, like 20 to 30,000. The average person has like 20, 30,000 different concepts. So you have to ask, what's the probability that during my half-hour experiment, I happen to hit just the right cell that just happened to respond to Jennifer Aniston? So you can do that, and then I spare you the details. You get, you get, you get numbers like this: that roughly we get a quarter of a, a percent sparseness. In other words, the, t the typical neuron will, re will respond on average only to one out of 400 different images. And if you put in this number supplied by Earth Biedermann of 10 to 30,000 distinct concepts, and we are roughly recording from a billion neurons, if you count the left and the right middle temporal lobe, which includes the hippocampus, amygdala, parahippocampal gyrus, entorhinal cortex, roughly a billion neurons, 10 to the 9, you get something that each concept, each of these 10 to 30,000 concepts, is stored in an invariant way in roughly 2 million neurons. So this is a lot of neurons, 2 times 10 to the 6. Of course, it's a tiny fraction of all the neurons that are present. And each neuron represents 20 to 70 concepts. So it's a far cry from a grandmother neuron, right? The grandmother neuron would be, each neuron would represent one concept, just grandmother. This is very unlikely to be true. So these are, in fact, this is not conceptually, if you read uh, Barlow's early paper um, in 1972, it's remarkable if you look at the last paragraph, I mean, his numbers are quite different. And of course, now we have data, but it's really close to, to the ideas that Horace Barlow had about cardinal neurons um, more than 30 years ago. All right, so let me come to the last part. Um, the need uh, for doing um, mouse experiments, and that's, I think, where a lot of our efforts will go in, in, the, in the next year. So these are experiments done together with David Anderson at Caltech, Michael Fanslow at uh, UCLA, and two postdocs in my lab, C.J. Han and Colm O'Toothaid. So the idea of what we want to do, because ultimately we want to move to perturbation techniques. We want to take advantage of molecular biology to perturb the system, to enact. To t We'd like to understand consciousness at the circuit level. In order to do that, we need to, we need to specifically, deliberately, transiently, reversibly inactivate and activate different sets of neuron population. I like to toggle off all the, all the groups of cells that, see that sit in layer f um, uh, that sit in layer 5A in a monkey, and that just those neurons that project uh, to the claustrum, for instance. I want to inactivate this group of interneurons in layer 3, um, just see those in order to see what's the effect of that. That really requires a, a molecular technique. So we have to do what people in medicine do, or lots of other areas in biology. We have to develop a rodent model of consciousness. And once again, we are not saying that con mouse are conscious as we are, but we're saying they share some aspects of consciousness. Now, they're not very visual, this. They have eyes, they have visual cortex. It's been very difficult, as Mike Stryker can tell you, it's been very difficult to get mice to do visual things uh, quite, uh, very well. But where it works very well. So this is Pavlovian aversive conditioning, you know, the dog and the saliva. This is negative uh, um, uh, conditioning that we're doing in mice and we're doing in Caltech undergraduate students. So with, uh, we, we, with tones and sharks. 
So there are two forms of conditioning. This is a question that goes back all the way to 1923 or so, where people first ask, do you need, do you need to be conscious in order to be conditioned? 